Okay, so we're going to wrap up our conversation about speciation and macroevolution here. Um, again, big things I want you guys to remember is how things change, how species change over time. Connect this back to the previous chapters where we talked about mutations and natural selection and genetic drift and all those things that lead to different types of selection, directional selection, stabilizing selection, disruptive selection. As species undergo those selection process, they speciate. And what used to be the same species now splits and becomes different, different species. Adaptive radiation is just part of that, that ancestral species gives rise to new ones that are adapted to, to a specific environment. And that's something I really, really want to stress is the environmental role in all of this as the environment changes. And it has changed throughout the course of the Earth's history. That helps drive adaptation and speciation. It also leads to extinction. So if you can't adapt, you're gone. Your species goes extinct. Okay, so we see lots and lots of examples. We can do it in the laboratory with bacteria and things that have very, very short generation cycles. But trying to do speciation with other things that live for long periods of time and reproduce very slowly is not realistic. We cannot speciate horses today because we can't wait thousands of years to see enough generations. Okay, So keep that perspective in mind. So the last thing to wrap up here is when we watch speciation and we look at the, the uh, evidence for it, fossil records, anatomical records, molecular information, etc., biogeography, etc., we see the bigger picture. And the bigger picture of evolution is what's called macroevolution. Now remember, we talked about micro in our previous chapter when we were talking about how populations evolve. That's looking at it at the population level with microevolution. Macro is a large change, or macroevolution are large changes in a species that can lead to the evolution of new species over a long period of time. Okay, so we're talking tens of millions of years for this process to occur. So our example to the side here, let me get the pen out. The example is the evolution of aquatic animals, aquatic mammals in particular. So we have an orca, orca whale. And you go, wow, is that, that's a mammal based on basic mammalian features, hair and breast milk. Some other key features make these animals whales, or make these whales mammals, even though they live in the ocean. Mammals don't have to live just on land. So they are classified as a mammal. And Cuvier would have said, orcas have always been orcas. They've never changed. They're always the same thing. But the evidence for evolution says, no. These guys have an ancestor that used to live on land. It used to be a land-based mammal, and it evolved into the mammals we see in the ocean today. So a piece of anatomical evidence that supports us. These little hip bones right there. Why have hip bones if you've never had an ancestor that walked on land? Why have the DNA for that? Seems like a pretty poor design if the orca was always an orca and it was always in the water and never changed. Why, why have hip bones? That's a bad design. Why design it with hip bones or why would it have those if that wasn't a vestigial structure left over from a previous ancestor? So let's rewind the evolutionary clock and go back about 60 million years ago. This is supposed to be 60. Okay, again, sorry for the, uh, Poor drawing with the mouse. It's definitely a challenging aspect of these lectures. Okay, so 60 million years ago, there were land-based mammals running around. This thing called Pachyocetus. Four limbs, 
It's got hip bones, shoulders, tail, etc. All the basic mammal features to make it a mammal. Now, over millions of years, some members of that population started to adapt to a more aquatic lifestyle. And this is where we get into this species known as Ambulocetus. So think about the difference between a dog and an otter. They're both mammals, four legs. Think about hair, the breast milk, the body plan. Otters are much more adaptable to water. They can come out on land and run around on land, but they work really well in water. Think about Ambulocetus like an otter. Not completely aquatic, not completely terrestrial. Kind of an in-between species. Goes back and forth between the two environments. Over millions and millions and millions of more years, this animal or this species gives rise to Rhodocetus. Now they're a lot more aquatic. So the front limbs kind of elongate and the fingers widen out here to become more of a flipper. The hind limbs not using them nearly as much because you're spending the majority of your time in the water. So I want you guys to think about a seal. Seals, they're mammals. They have a, a mammal ancestral history. They're by far primarily aquatic based animals. They can come out on land for a little bit and kind of hop around and move around and they're really meant to be in the water. But they still have those back legs, that flipper in the back there that says somewhat land-based. And then let's fast forward another 10, 15, whatever million years and get to the completely aquatic orca. Lives in the water, completely functional in the water, but we still see the vestigial remnants of hip bones saying that information, that DNA is there because it was used by your previous ancestors. So macroevolution is the big changes over long periods of time in the course of evolution. We cannot witness macroevolution. Nobody can sit down and watch 60 million years of speciation. It's just not realistic. So when we look at macroevolution, we, we reconstruct it with all the lines of evidence that support evolution. Fossil records, anatomical records, the molecular information, the biogeography, etc. All those lines support the macroevolution process. All right, now a big advancement in support for evolution, especially macro, is our understanding of genetics, our growing knowledge of genetics. Developmental genes play a big role in macroevolution. So here's just a few of the genes we talk about. PAX6, HOX, TBX5, PITX1, etc. These genes all control specific developmental features in all living organisms. Let me back up, all animals, okay? They're animal genes. So why do we all have these same genes that develop our eyes, that locate our body structures, limb buds, pelvic fin buds, etc.? Why would all these animals have the same genes unless they were related? And then over hundreds of millions of years, evolution, natural selection, gene flow, etc., cause us to move into our specific ecological niches. So there's another line of evidence supporting it. Now, as we watch the big picture of evolution, we will see generally two patterns. Pattern one is what we call gradualism. Okay, gradualism is a slow, gradual change in a species over time. It takes millions of years for gradualism to occur. Little changes each generation, each generation, each generation. So when we look at gradualism, there are often lots of transitional fossils showing this splitting of the species. And it takes a long, long time. We're talking millions and millions of years. So those... Type, that type of evolutionary process, macroevolutionary process, is easier, not simple, but easier to work with than the other type of evolutionary process that we call punctuated equilibrium. Now, in punctuated equilibrium, there is no change for a long period of time. 
then an abrupt change in a species. Okay, something happens environmentally, maybe continents are drifting, things are changing, and boom, all of a sudden you now have new species evolving because there's a very fairly quick change in the environment. Now that doesn't mean in two years you're going to see the evolutionary process, but it might be 20,000, 50,000 years and environmental change pushes a bunch of species to extinction, so the surviving species adapt and evolve very quickly. So we often have very few transitional fossils for this because of this rapid, rapid, what we consider a rapid process when we talk about geological time and evolutionary time. So those are the two types of changes and kind of modes of evolution that we'll see when we look at the big picture of macro evolution. All right, so the last thing to leave you with on this topic, macro evolution is not a straight line process. Please don't think, oh, it just goes straight, that species A turned into this. This is what was meant to evolve. No, a lot of it is just pure chance. If the environment changed differently, the existing species may not have ever evolved. So people often think, oh, well, humans are the pinnacle of evolution. It's the end result. No, it's not. There was no direction to say, let's see mammals and primates eventually evolve into humans. We are here, a lot of it is due to chance that this is how the evolutionary process worked, and it's what led to the human species, Homo sapiens. There are plenty of other species of humans out there, or let me back that up, members of genus Homo that didn't succeed. Now, if the environment had been different, maybe they would have succeeded and we would never evolve to where we are at. So it has, macroevolution doesn't really have a direction. There's tons of dead ends because those species were not the fittest, the most adaptable for that particular environment, and they, they went extinct. Others continued to move forward and evolve and adapt and survive. So that is the natural process when we talk about macroevolution. The interesting thing, as a species, humans, we are defying evolution. There are plenty of humans, myself included, that would not be alive naturally if we didn't use technology to defy evolution. So I wear contacts. If I took out my contacts, I would not be able to survive. So we're using, I'm using technology in order to defy natural selection. So again, think about natural selection. If you can't see, you're not going to survive real well. All right, so we'll wrap up the evolutionary topic in our last lecture when we talk about the origins of life. We look at the scientific evidence and basis for how life started on our planet. And then we'll look at kind of a timeline. This is where we get into the fossil record and look at all the different eras and periods of the Earth's history to say, what happened when? And how do we know this happened at these different periods of time? We'll take a look at all that information in the last lecture or the next lecture in the evolutionary, the unit on evolution.